Okay, we're good. All right. So, hello everyone. My name is Katherine Riedel. I'm the Assistant Director at the Rye Free Reading Room. Welcome to our program this evening from Thomas Jefferson to Kraft, A History of Macaroni and Cheese. The program is taught by Sarah Wasberg Johnson, otherwise known as the Food Historian. Sarah is an author, speaker, educator, podcaster, and blogger on all things related to food history. She's a frequent interviewee of journalists looking for historical context and was featured in all three episodes of the History Channel miniseries, The Food That Built America. She's been featured on NPR, The Atlantic, CNN, Atlas Obscura, and more. She has published in New York History Journal and the Agricultural History Journal, and is currently finalizing edits on her book, Preserver Parish, Food in New York State during the Great War, 1916 to 1919. Sarah is one of our favorite presenters at the Rye Free Reading Room. And at this moment, I'll just hand the program over to you, Sarah. Thank you. Thanks, Catherine. Um, so if anybody watched the first season of The Food That Built America, the second season actually started, I think, on Sunday. Um, and I am not in all of those episodes, but I am in at least one of the episodes. Uh, so if you want to check that out, uh, they're pretty fun shows. So here's what we're going to do tonight. I, this is actually like a two-part program. So uh, I have a little video demonstration of making macaroni and cheese. I see some of you are eating macaroni and cheese, which is awesome. Um, so I'm going to do a little video cooking demo that's pre-recorded. Uh, we'll pause for questions, and then I'm going to go into the history part of it, and then we'll pause for questions at the end of that, too. So if you have questions at any time, um, you can drop them in the chat, and then I'll, I'm not going to answer them as I go, because then I get really distracted and lose my train of thought, which is bad. Um, but I'll, we'll take pauses to answer questions, and I'm always happy to answer questions and all that fun stuff. So want to make sure can everyone just make sure they're muted i think most everybody is lillian i'm going to mute you lillian um and i'm going to go ahead and get started and with this video so Catherine, just so you know once i start the video i don't i can't see what everybody's doing so i'll rely on you to if anybody else comes in i'll rely on you to mute people <laughs> okay so i'm gonna share screen if it lets me come back And, oh, I have too many windows open. Where's my movie? Oh, good grief. Give me one second. Sorry about that, guys. It closed out on me, so I have to open it again. <laughs> I had everything all set up, and then it went by. There we go. All right, now my sound share clicked on. So here starts the mac and cheese demo. Hi, I'm Sarah Wasberg Johnson. Welcome to the Food Historian Kitchen. Today we're going to be making one of my favorite comfort foods, macaroni and cheese. But unlike some of my other comfort food series we've done, we're not going to be making it from a historic recipe. We're going to be using my family recipe um, that I use a lot and cook in my own home. And there is a good reason for that, and that is because most historic recipes for macaroni and cheese are very different than the type of macaroni and cheese we're used to eating today. Most historic recipes were simply boiled pasta, often boiled until very tender, sometimes borderline falling apart, butter and grated cheese, layered and baked, like you would with polenta. Um, and I didn't think that was going to be very good. <laughs> so we're not going to be doing that today. Instead, we're going to be making a roux-based stovetop mac and cheese. Um, pretty quick, very easy, super delicious. Uh, and then we'll talk a little bit as we go along the way about all the different historic types of macaroni and cheese uh, that there are. So I've got a pot of salted water boiling here, and I have 
all my ingredients assembled. We have some shredded um, mild cheddar cheese, nothing too sharp. Uh, we have a stick of unsalted butter. We have just your basic grocery store brand, semolina uh, elbow noodles, right? Uh, and then we have some flour, and we'll also be needing some whole milk. So, um, it's a pretty straightforward recipe. We're going to be making a roux, which is where you cook flour and butter together. And you don't need any real special equipment except for this. This lovely little thing is a sauce whisk. It's not required to make a roux, but it sure is helpful because it has a nice flat bottom, which means you can kind of scrape the bottom of the pan so that the roux doesn't burn as you're cooking it. All right, so let's go ahead and get started. Okay, so our water is boiling. Nice hard boil, that means time to add the pasta. You just dump it all in. And then give it a quick stir to make sure that it doesn't stick together or stick to the bottom of the pot. Right, so we're gonna let that come back to a boil. And in the meantime, our butter is melting and we're gonna be making our roux in this little uh, two quart stock pot that I have going on. This is a four quart stock pot. We're making the whole pound of pasta because if you're gonna make macaroni and cheese, you might as well make the whole box, right? Um, it is very good. So especially even if it's just two people, you're gonna eat a lot of it, so. All right, let's switch over to our roux. I thought we'd try something from my perspective with filming because I want you guys to be able to see inside this pot that we're going to be using. So I'm going to turn the, the heat onto medium. And we're going to add one stick of butter. So that is also a half cup of butter. And what we're going to do is we're going to let it sit in this hot pot. We're going to let it melt and we're going to let it come to a boil, right? So we'll come back when it's ready to go. Okay, so we have our pasta is boiling away. Let me give that just a little bit of a stir. Oh yeah, I can feel it starting to stick together again. You definitely want to stir it again. Once it comes up to a boil, make sure it's not sticking. We're going to let that boil for about 10 minutes. And then this other noise that you hear over here, this nice sound that's happening, that is the butter boiling. So we don't want it to go too long because we don't want it to brown. So we're going to add our flour and start stirring. So a roux is made of equal parts of flour and butter. Um, and a stick of butter is um, a quarter cup, so we're going to add a quarter cup gradually. Oh, you can see it's bubbling up, right? And the goal is to get it all whisked in. You see how nice the sauce whisk does it? To get it all whisked in with no lumps, right? And you don't want any unincorporated flour. So now this is the stage where a lot of people make a mistake. And I totally did this the first couple of times I tried to make a roux or a white sauce. And that is, I didn't let the flour cook, right? So if you, if you just melt butter and add flour without letting it cook, it'll taste like wallpaper paste, no matter how much milk you add. So we don't want that to happen. All right, so we're keeping the heat on medium. We're just gonna let that cook for a second and then get our milk. Okay, so our roux has been cooking for maybe like 30 seconds to a minute. That's plenty. You don't want it to turn into brown butter sauce uh, for mac and cheese. And I have my gallon of milk here, and we're just going to start adding it gradually. It's okay that it's cold, so traditionally a bechamel sauce, which is technically what we're making. Oh, you see how thick that got? Traditionally a bechamel sauce, you add scalded milk which is heated, right? But it's totally fine to add just regular cold milk right from the fridge. That's what I always do. You do want to also um, reverse the direction of your stirring every once in a while. And basically what you're doing is the flour 
is thickening the liquid as you add it. So the bad and good thing about adding the cold milk is it does slow the cooking down a little, which is great if you're a beginner because otherwise your roux can really get away from you. So by adding the cold milk, um, that means you have a little bit more time to just kind of leave it. Right, and you can go do other things like check on your pasta, which I'm gonna do right now. Okay, I did reduce the heat a little bit just because I didn't want it to boil over, but we're still having a nice boil here. And we're gonna cook the pasta for about 10 minutes. Um, to be honest, I don't usually put a timer on. I just uh, know how long it takes to make the roux and then I test the pasta um, by biting it when I think it's done or by you know trying to smush it with a spoon, right? We're not gonna do it quite as much as the 19th century macaroni and cheese eaters would do it. All right, so you can see this is taking a while to thicken up, but it is getting there, and it's gonna get there kind of quickly. So a lot of recipes for a white sauce will tell you you have to stir constantly. That's not really true. You can leave it, you know, for 20, 30 seconds, especially if it's really liquidy. Um, but it does seize up quickly. So you do have to keep an eye on it, even if you're not watching it 100% of the time. So right now what's happening is I can tell it's thickening up because um, it's getting a little bit harder to move the whisk through. You can see it's starting to thicken up. It's starting to leave tracks a little bit. I'm gonna let it thicken a little bit more before we add some more milk. I never measure milk, but um, you're probably going to want about a quart of milk, depending, um, because whenever I make the sauce, it usually makes um, about a quart of sauce. So, oh yeah, see there, it's starting to thick up. So we're adding some more milk, just gradually giving it a good whisk as we go. And once you get really good at this, you can, um, I'm multitasking today. You can boil your pasta first and then do the roux if you're worried about doing them at the same time. Or you can do the roux first and then the pasta, but the roux will continue to thicken as it sits. Just keep that in mind. It's time to add the cheese. I have some pre-shredded, um, just like I said, mild or just regular sharp cheddar, and we're gonna use about a cup appreciate it. You can use more, you can use less, um, you can use other kinds of cheeses. I would not recommend using very, um, very sharp cheddars because they do, even with a roux, um, sometimes they can taste a little grainy because they are very sharp uh, and you want them to be smooth and kind of creamy. Oh yeah, I can tell this is thickening up already, but that's okay. We want it to be nice and hot so that it melts the cheese before we add, before we add um, more milk. It does take a little bit of muscle to make a good roux. Um, and you could probably get a sauce whisk with a more comfortable handle than this. This one is from Ikea. I think it was part of a set with a balloon whisk. But you can see the sauce is starting to turn that nice kind of classic orange color that we expect from macaroni and cheese. Um, a lot of cheddar cheese is actually dyed orange with annatto, uh, which is a natural coloring that comes from a seed. So it's not gonna be that bright craft orange, but it's pretty close. Now is also a good time to salt. Um, a lot of people, particularly if you don't salt your pasta water, um, you're gonna need your sauce to be quite salty. And I don't measure too much. You probably wanna start with, ooh, that's kind of a lot, but at least a teaspoon and go from there. I can tell I cook a lot with my hands. 
Um, and then you want to taste toward the end for salt. And we are going to add my secret ingredient. So I'm going to go get it. Ladies and gents, that is my secret ingredient, Dijon mustard. So I add not a ton, but you know, like probably about a tablespoon or so. And the reason why I add mustard is because it adds a little depth of flavor and a tanginess and actually makes it taste more like cheddar cheese. You don't want to add too much because then it gets to be like a mustard sauce and not a cheese sauce. Um, but just a little bit gives that little bit of depth. All right, you see how thick this is? We don't want this this thick for the mac and cheese. So we're going to add more milk. Get it nice and liquidy again. Remember, it'll always cook down and also the pasta will continue to absorb some of the milk, but you can also see how much that has made, right? Look how close it is to the top of this two quart saucepan. Okay, let's check on our pasta. Okay, time to do a little taste test of our pasta here. Mmm, that is pretty much perfect. So time to drain. Okay, all right, this is thickening back up nicely and I have oops, a nice clean spoon. We're just gonna, oh yeah, so that you can see, it's another trick to see how thick it is, is how nicely it coats the spoon. And we're also gonna give it a little taste test for salt. Mmm. I think it needs a little more salt. Because remember, this is going on fairly bland pasta. So the sauce should always be a little saltier than you think it needs to be. Because the pasta is going to absorb a lot more flavor than just eating the sauce by itself. Okay, I think we're ready to combine. Okay, so I've drained our pasta and put it back in the pot. We have our finished um, Mornay sauce, really a bechamel with uh, cheese in it. And I'm just going to give it one last whisk and we're going to pour it in. So now, if you like your mac and cheese baked, the thing to do would be to undercook your pasta a little bit so that it was a little bit more al dente. Um, and then do this. <laughs> And then pour it into a baking dish and bake it at like 350. Some people do um, more cheese on top. Some people like to do uh, butter and breadcrumbs so you get like a crispy breadcrumb topping. I like it more on the stove top because um, it's faster usually. <laughs> and when I'm making, making mac and cheese, that's usually like my fast week night comfort food, right? You had a long day at work. You want something quick, but not takeout. Like you might be sick of takeout. Um, it's also much cheaper than takeout. Uh, and you might notice, I don't know if you can tell from a distance, but it's fairly liquidy still. Um, and that's totally okay because as the pasta sits, it'll absorb some of the sauce and then it'll thicken right up. So if you're worried you've made your bechamel or your Mornay sauce too liquidy um, and you've already poured it in the pot, just give it a couple minutes uh, and that pasta will suck some of that extra moisture right up and you'll have really good macaroni and cheese. So now we have our moment of truth, right? So I usually like mine extra salty. Um, and I'll often put black pepper on top, but we're just gonna try it as it is. It's still a little liquidy. I probably should let it cool a little bit more, but I can't wait. It's too delicious. Here we go.
that hits the spot. It could actually use a little bit more salt um, because even though I salted the pasta water, I didn't put that much salt in. Um, but I figure it's always better to under salt. People can add salt to the table if they like because um, everybody has different tolerances. But that is creamy and delicious. I'm not at all just butter and cheese baked in a dish. So this is my recipe for macaroni and cheese. I make it a lot with my family. I hope you enjoyed our little cooking demo and I hope if you haven't made mac and cheese from scratch before, you'll give it a try. All right, thanks so much for joining me everybody. We'll see you next time. Okay. Did anybody have any questions about the cooking demo? I did just want to note um, one thing that I Hi, didn't. I'm Sarah Walker, oh my I'm gosh, sorry, Walker, hold on. Stop. It started playing again. Um, uh, the shredded cheddar definitely do not use bagged pre-shredded cheese um, because they add an anti-caking agent to that, which will prevent it from fully melting into your sauce. Um, so I just wanted to make that note. Did anybody else have any questions before we move on to the history part? You could drop your questions in the chat, or I think you can unmute yourselves too. No. <laughs> All right. Well, if you think of any, um, you could drop them in the chat later, and we will start with our history portion. Sarah, I have a question. Yeah, go ahead. Do you want me to put the recipe in the chat for people? Oh, sure. Yeah. yeah. Then you just look at it and make sure I didn't mess anything up. Oh, goodness. All right. Hold on. Let me bring the chat up then. <laughs> I think I got it. Well, let me view the chat. It won't. It won't. Nope. You can check it at the end. I'll check it at the end. <laughs> All right, so um, tonight's talk, obviously, the talk portion of this is called From Jefferson to Kraft, A History of Macaroni and Cheese, uh, which is a really a quintessential American dish in a lot of ways, even though it makes its way to the United States through France. So we're going to talk a little bit about um, the background and some of the history of some of the ingredients. Uh, and I thought we would start by going way back who is making the first macaroni and cheese and where does it start? And so I think the earliest kind of antecedent to macaroni and cheese is uh, cacio e pepe, which pardon my Italian pronunciation if it's terrible, <laughs> which um, was used by Roman shepherds in the Apennine Mountains. Um, it's dried pasta, purportedly tonarelli, which is a kind of pasta that's um, like long hollow tubes. Um, aged pecorino, which is the cacio, which pecorino is a hard salty aged sheep's milk cheese. So if you're a shepherd, you're probably making your own pecorino, right? And then black peppercorns, which actually make their way to ancient Rome quite early. I actually looked that up to see when they came um, via, I believe they're from India, and they come on the, essentially, the, you know, the ancient Silk Road um, quite, quite early in, in Roman history. So the, they were around for a long time. And the reason why this becomes, um, you know, kind of such the perfect shepherd dish is that all of these things are very lightweight. You don't need a lot of pecorino, dried pasta is very lightweight, black peppercorns are very lightweight, I'm sure they also have salt. But maybe not if their pecorino was very salty. Um, so basically you boil your pasta, you leave some of the pasta water in with the pasta, you shred your pecorino into the pasta water which is starchy and kind of makes like this smooth sauce when the pecorino melts into the hot pasta and then you put fresh cracked black pepper on top. So it's pretty similar to how a lot of us eat macaroni and cheese today, except for we usually make some sort of sauce or some other kind of fat involved. 
Um, I like my macaroni and cheese with lots of black pepper. So this is my theory about what the oldest uh, version of macaroni and cheese is. Um, as we get further into like Europe and as this dish spreads, you do get a shift from pecorino to parmesan, which is a cow's milk based aged salty cheese from Italy. <laughs> um, so that you're going to get that a little bit of that shift. Uh, and then in the 14th, well, really the 12th, 13th and 14th century, um, you start to get the use of pasta outside of Italy. Uh, and then also you start to get the spread of cheese and pasta outside of Italy. So really in the 1600s, um, wheat prices fall throughout Europe, which makes pasta and other wheat-based products much more affordable. So that's really when people in Europe start to consume pasta on a larger scale than they did previously. So this is, um, this is the cacio e pepe recipe. Um, so it's basically, you can use it with spaghetti. You drain most, but not all of the pasta water. Uh, I guess part of it is you have to have very finely grated Pecorino Romano, um, which if you have like a very fine cheese grater, it's like very fluffy, right? Very finely grated cheese is very fluffy. And so that's what helps it melt into the sauce. Um, and I, there's a note that if the cheese is not finely grated, it will break and the sauce will be grainy, which nobody wants that. So um, I found this great illustration from an illuminated manuscript. So this is women making pasta. So you can see they're rolling out the pasta dough. Um, a lot of this probably would have been egg-based pasta if you're making your own. And you can see the woman is placing on the drying rack these very, very fine shreds of pasta. So she's making like spaghetti style pasta. Uh, we also then in 1390 or thereabouts have the form of Curie, which is a very early British cook cookbook. Um, and this is the original kind of a Middle English <laughs> version of macaroni. So I did a little translation. So it's you take and make a thin foil of dough, cut it into pieces, cast it into boiling water and seethe or cook it well. Take cheese and grate it and butter melted. And then it says layer beneath and above as lasagna. So lasagna already a familiar dish for people uh, and then serve it forth. So presumably you also bake it too, like, like a lasagna, I would think. Um, so that's another very early recipe. Um, this is a great illustration from 1805. So um, spaghetti becomes very popular in Naples. Uh, in the early, late 18th and early 19th century, um, because wheat prices had fallen, it becomes much more accessible to working class people and a lot of working class people have become known as spaghetti eaters. And if you'll notice, what utensils are they using to eat the spaghetti? Their hands, right? They're not using forks or spoons or anything like how we would eat pasta today. So what's the American connection, right? So you might know the Yankee Doodle song, they called him macaroni. So macaroni is uh, actually a British term that refers to someone who is a dandy, right? So um, in the Yankee Doodle song, they called him macaroni means they're identifying somebody as a dandy or someone who is very concerned with fashion and how they present themselves to the world. Um, but it really gets introduced to the Americas and popularized by James Hemings, um, who was enslaved by Thomas Jefferson. Thomas Jefferson brings him with him to France in the 1780s, pretty much for the express purpose of James training to be um, a French chef. So he encounters macaroni in France. He also introduces um, and brings back creme brulee, meringue, whipped cream, all kinds of stuff. In 1789, Jefferson actually imports a macaroni machine. So that's for making, um, you know, not just rolled pasta, but probably tube pasta or shaped pasta. And the interesting thing about James Hemings, um, who is actually, you know, so of course, 
Thomas Jefferson has a relationship with the woman he enslaves, Sally Hemings. James Hemings is her brother. Also, they have another brother, brother Peter Hemings, so we'll talk about later. Um, and both Sally and James accompany Jefferson to France, where they could have been freed, right? Because slavery is illegal in France as soon as they set foot on French soil. Legally, they could have been freed. Um, but all of their family is back in Virginia. So they actually kind of negotiate a little bit with Jefferson um, in order to return with him. And part of that was James Hemings did actually receive um, a, uh, he received some wages, even though he was enslaved uh, to be Jefferson's chef, he did receive some wages. Um, and he eventually is freed, which we'll talk about in a minute. Um, but there's also a Jeffersonian connection to Mary Randolph. So Mary Randolph um, is related to Thomas Jefferson and her husband actually worked in, in Jefferson's um, administration while he was president. And in 1824, she publishes The Virginia Housewife, um, which contains a number of French and Spanish recipes, including macaroni and cheese. And so there's some speculation that her macaroni and cheese recipe is actually James Hemings macaroni and cheese recipe. And that cookbook becomes hugely popular in the South. Um, there are still people today studying it um, and using it. Uh, and so that becomes very influential in popularizing macaroni and cheese in the South. So this is the Virginia housewife Mary Randolph's two recipes. I find it very interesting that there's both a macaroni and a mock macaroni recipe. So the macaroni that you know, if you didn't, weren't like Jefferson and didn't have your own macaroni machine, you were importing it from Italy. And there's actually some evidence that Italian pasta, especially, um, you know, the longer pieces of pasta or the shaped pasta were actually made thicker than they were in Italy so that they could survive being exported without breaking as much. So, um, Definitely, I think that's why some of those early, earlier macaroni recipes call for boiling it for longer than we would today. Um, but she just says to boil it till quite tender. I did make a reference in the video to some recipes call for boiling the pasta until it falls apart, which is like not how we would do it today, but they also called for boiling vegetables until they practically fell apart. Um, but so this is the same, you know, you're layering. Um, interestingly, she says to boil it in milk and water and then drain it, salt it, and then layer it with cheese and butter as the polenta, which is the recipe before this, and bake it, right? And then she has a recipe for mock macaroni, which I find very interesting. So if you couldn't find imported Italian pasta, um, you could substitute crackers, right? Which were available commercially, like, um, common crackers or like pilot crackers or kind of like big oyster crackers are the kinds of crackers that people had in that period, kind of similar to hard tack, right? So you have to soak them until they're soft and then basically do the previous recipe, but with soaked crackers instead of macaroni. So we have kind of a persistence of the butter and cheese option throughout the 19th century. But we do also start to get later in the 19th century, the introduction of a bechamel or Mornay sauce. And that is, bechamel is one of the French mother sauces, they're called. Um, so the real kind of origin of that starts in France, possibly in Italy, and then goes to France, not super clear. Um, but one of the first printed references is in 1651, Pierre-Francois Varenne. Um, writes about a liaison de farine. So that is like the joining of flour and fat to create a roux, which is the base of a number of French mother sauces, uh, which we did in the video. Uh, in 1733, Vince La Chapelle in The Modern Cook um, first uses the term bechamel in print, which is basically a roux-based white sauce. Uh, and then The Art of French Cuisine at the, in the 19th Century by Marie-Antoine Carême, super influential chef, French chef, called himself the chef de kings, we'll get to him in a minute. Um, he invents 
les grandes sauces. So not the mother sauces, the great sauces. So there's sauce espagnol, um, sauce velouté, which is another roux-based sauce, but is made with um, brown or beef stock. Uh, sauce alemán, which I forget what goes into that, and then the bechamel sauce, which is actually a white sauce made with veal stock, not necessarily, um, sorry, espanol sauce is a brown, so brown stock, velouté is with veal stock, and then bechamel is a velouté enriched with cream. It's hard to keep track because aside from bechamel, most of us don't make any of these sauces anymore. Um, and then in 1903, Auguste Escoffier um, writes Le Guide Culinaire, which is widely available throughout Europe and the United States. Um, he actually expands some other sauces to include hollandaise and mayonnaise um, and really popularizes them outside of France, including in the US. Um, so yeah, that's kind of our background of sauces for macaroni and cheese. Here's the Marie Antoine Carême. He's really one of the first celebrity chefs and chef to celebrity. He called himself the chef to kings. Um, and he really popularizes la grande cuisine, which now today we would call like French haute cuisine, um, that very high level French cooking that still today is kind of revered in kitchens around the world. Um, so he invents a number of classic dishes, so the mother sauces, he invents croque and bouche, um, millefeuille, he's actually mostly a pastry chef, um, Charlotte Russe, which you start to see all over the United States in the 19th century. Um, and so he's just kind of an important guy in cuisine history, but it's the mother sauces, that's the real connection for us. All right, so what's the soul food connection? Because you maybe heard about um, the role of macaroni and cheese in black food and soul food in restaurants and at Thanksgiving and barbecues and all that fun stuff. So a number of researchers of the life of James Hemings have called enslaved chefs like James Hemings and his brother Peter Hemings the ghost in the kitchen. So for much of American history, the people primarily doing most of the cooking were enslaved. And because they were enslaved, they were either ignored by history or erased or kind of made invisible, not given credit. So there's been a movement by historians to kind of study these invisible people. We don't have pictures of them. The records of them are few and far between. Um, and so to draw those connections for how they have influenced American food, which American food is really kind of an amalgamation of European, indigenous American, and African food ways, right? Because that's the kind of confluence of foods that are happening in the United States. So macaroni and cheese starts out as kind of like a luxury food, right? It's imported pasta, it's a ton of butter, it's a ton of cheese, it's quite expensive. Um, and enslaved chefs and cooks cooked it a lot in wealthy Southern households. This is mostly in the South, although obviously we did have enslaved cooks and chefs in Northern households as well until the early 19th century. Um, and so, and a lot of people of color were also working in hotels and restaurants and things like that. So it's this kind of wealthy food. Um, but as the century wears on, a lot of these these ingredients get cheaper. Pasta gets cheaper. Um, dairy products get a little bit cheaper and more affordable. Cheese becomes more affordable, right? So after emancipation, after the Civil War, um, suddenly people who had been formerly enslaved, they could had the potential to afford these things for themselves. And so a lot of these richer dishes that were not available to them during enslavement became kind of these pinnacle foods that were desirable during emancipation. So obviously this isn't available to everybody, but for the free people who, you know, the 40 acres and the slave never material, the four, sorry, the 40 acres and a mule, gosh, never materialized for pretty much anybody, but free black people who had been free prior to the Civil War during emancipation, they had a lot more opportunity. During Reconstruction, they had more opportunity. And so these foods, things like 
macaroni and cheese, things like um, deviled eggs, uh, potato salad with a lot of mayonnaise and eggs and things like that that had been unattainable suddenly are attainable and so they become you know much more popular. Um, a lot of black in the black community a lot of people call it macaroni pie in part because it's almost exclusively baked. It's not stovetop. <laughs> it's not the quick weeknight food that I enjoy. Um, it's usually baked. There are usually complicated secret recipes involved. It's usually for special occasions. Um, very rich. Um, and everybody kind of has their own variation. And then for Thanksgiving, it was actually on macaroni and cheese is on white people northern menus in the 19th century. And they kind of disappear at the turn of the 20th century, but it stays on a lot of menus um, in Black communities and Black families. It becomes kind of like a Thanksgiving specialty. So that's kind of where we start to diverge in the 20th century. OK, so James Hemings. This picture is not James Hemings. It's also not um, Hercules Posey, the chef of George Washington, although for many years people thought it was him. Um, really up until 2010 or later, people attributed it to um, Hercules Posey. But it's not. It's an unknown Black Dominican man wearing a Dominican headdress. It's not a chef's toque. But I keep it here um, because we don't have any images of James Hemings at all, which is extraordinarily sad. Um, so he was enslaved in the household of Martha Skelton, who was Jefferson's wife. And uh, when her father died, she inherited him. So she brought James into with her when she married Thomas Jefferson. So in 1784, he goes with Thomas Jefferson to France and he trains for three years in France to become a chef de cuisine. And he negotiates his freedom in 1796 um, with the promise that he will train his brother Peter as his replacement. So that was a condition of his freedom. Um, and in 19, so he like after that, after he's free, he travels the world for a little while, he cooks um, for pay. Uh, in 1801, Jefferson actually convinces him to return as a paid chef at the president's house. It was not the White House at that point. But two months later, so he starts in, you know, August, September, or possibly October. Anyway, two months later, uh, he dies. And it's suspected he dies by suicide. So we don't really know how or why he died, but that is one of the suspicions. So um, kind of a sad life for someone who was so incredibly influential in American cuisine and really hasn't been that recognized until quite recently. Okay, so how do we get from bechamel, this French mother sauce, to the ubiquitous white sauce? Um, in 1828, Louis Eustace, uh, Eustace Ude uh, publishes The French Cook, which is a French cookbook published specifically for a British audience. And he talks about bechamel maigre, or like thin, basically. So it's a bechamel made without veal stock, um, just with milk. And it's designed for uh, Lent when you can't have meat, right? And that kind of becomes the backbone of what most 19th century white sauces are. So in the Victorian era, um, particularly in the Gilded Age, we loved rich food, right? So if we had to eat vegetables, we wanted to put like a cream sauce or a white sauce on them. And during the progressive era, um, it really becomes like the fashionable way to serve just about anything. So Fanny Farmer, maybe you know the Fanny Farmer cookbook originally published in 1896. She actually has three separate recipes for what are essentially macaroni and cheese. She has macaroni with a plain white sauce, she has baked macaroni, and then she has macaroni with cheese, um, which we'll get to in a second. And then, like I said, the progressive era, a lot of progressive era reformers, uh, food reformers, home economists, nutrition scientists, um, white sauce, putting something white sauce on something was kind of like a more palatable way to get people to eat it, right? But it was also a way to get more milk 
into people and milk was considered the perfect food because it had um, fats, proteins, and carbohydrates all naturally occurring in it. Um, and that was kind of our, pretty much our nutrition science conventional wisdom at that point was we didn't really know about vitamins and minerals and all that fun stuff. So we're like, well, let's make vegetables better for you by putting a white sauce on them. Um, so these are the Fanny Farmer recipes. And this is me taking a picture of my actual Fanny Farmer cookbook, which is why it's slightly crooked. Um, so she's got a basic white sauce recipe in there. It doesn't make a lot. Um, and again, she's not making that much macaroni, right? It's not a large amount, not like me with my whole pound of macaroni. Her baked macaroni is, you know, put it in a white sauce and then put the buttered breadcrumbs on top, right, that we talked about. And then the macaroni and cheese is, um, you're combining this old fashioned layering technique of, um, you know, layering the boiled pasta with cheese, but then she's also adding the white sauce. It's cut off on the next page, but that's what it is, white sauce. All right, so let's talk a little bit about the history of the pasta itself in the United States. So Antoine Zarega is the first person to open an American pasta factory in 1848. He opens it on the Brooklyn waterfront, which is kind of cool, the New York connection. Um, it's horse powered, the pasta is sun dried, right? So he is making pasta domestically. Um, and once he starts, a lot of other people start. There are a number of references to kind of be careful where you're getting your pasta from and the quality. Um, I ran across one reference that said, if you're not careful with your pasta, you can get pasta that when you boil it, it'll just turn to paste. Like it doesn't hold its shape. It just is like flour and water, right? That's been dried. And when you boil it, it's just gonna turn to glue. Um, and by 1904, we have the National Association of Macaroni and Noodle Manufacturers of America, right? This is a very popular thing in the turn of the 20th century for a lot of these um, food manufacturers to start these national associations and clubs and to start kind of cooperating. Uh, in 1912, the Minnesota Macaroni Company invents creamettes, which maybe if you've seen um, some old community cookbooks, uh, you might see recipes that just call for creamettes, like a pound of creamettes. You didn't know what that was. It's a special kind of pasta, which we'll get to in a second. Uh, in 1928, we have Chef Boyardee, who starts canning pasta. Um, cook pasta, and in 1937, we get craft dinner. So that's kind of our little chronology here. And we'll go more in depth into some of these. Um, so this is creamettes, which were uh, kind of an innovation because they were designed to be quick cooking, right? So previously, a lot of imported and domestically produced pastas were quite thick. Um, you had to boil them for like 20 or 30 minutes to get them fully cooked. Creamettes were very thin, right? So their elbow pasta, you can see kind of the not very good drawing is supposed to be like the clear thing through the box, right? Um, much thinner and supposed to be much more uh, quick cooking and, and still tender and delicious, right? Like it says right on the package. Um, this is an illustration from 1923 that talks about the different shapes of macaroni and similar pastes, right? Not pastas, pastes. Um, and if you look, uh, number seven uh, on the list is macaroni and it's a long tube. It's a long hollow tube. So if you ever see references to recipes saying to break the macaroni into one inch pieces, that's what they're talking about. Um, and then if you look at like 19 and 20, you have tubetti which is the Italian version of what becomes American elbow macaroni, which is what cream is. All right, so let's talk a little bit about cheese, right? Because cheese plays a big role in, in macaroni and cheese. That's half of the equation. Um, so Americans love cheddar. And as early as the 1790s, American made British style cheddars were actually being exported back to England, which I found fascinating. Um, in 1804, you get the first reference, the first printed reference to American cheese, largely I think make, meaning cheese made in America. 
right? But that's a moniker that kind of sticks. And in 1916, James L. Kraft develops pasteurized processed cheese in Buffalo, New York. And we're going to talk more about him, but this is our little timeline intro. Um, in 1918, Emil Frey invents Velvina in Monroe, New York, which is like just down the road from where I live which is another pasteurized processed cheese. In 1919, um, the Pabst Brewing Company invents Pabst Et, which they designed to help them survive prohibition. Whether or not it actually contributed monetarily to their survival isn't super clear. They do survive prohibition, um, but I just find it interesting. A lot of you know brewing companies were trying to diversify and get into producing other things in an attempt to survive prohibition and cheese is the direction Pabst went. Uh, in 1952, um, the company that becomes Kraft invents cheese with, and then in 1965, we get Kraft singles, which are the individually wrapped processed cheese, right? So that's kind of our chronology of American cheese. So here are some fun images of Pabst at. So they have, they start out producing it as a spread in these little round tins and then in this instance um, this is from 1930 they also do like the loaf which is very Velveeta-y um, and then they also have different varieties like pimento cheese right Swiss all that fun stuff um, the ironic thing about Pabstet is that uh, Kraft actually sued them for copyright infringement because of course he had like patented the processed cheese process and they were essentially doing the same thing but they somehow like come to some kind of agreement. It's kind of murky, the history is kind of murky, but they do still keep producing it um, throughout prohibition. Um, and so we do start to get, Kraft also purchases Velveeta from Emil Frey pretty early on. Um, so this is an advertisement for Velveeta. Uh, it says for thrifty main dishes, catch on to the Kraft double, double boiler trick. So you melt the Velveeta on top of the double boiler and it's kind of like, um, you know, Welsh rare bit or a, just a very easy cheese sauce that you can like pour over things, right? And, and a lot of these cheeses were touted as kind of like meat substitutes. And I find the little bottom part I magnified um, up on top and they have their other, it says the world's favorite cheeses are made or imported by Kraft. And so it's got all these sort of like imported cheese like Old English and Chantel and McLaren's Imperial, right? But I'm pretty sure they're all pasteurized cheese made by Kraft, which I find interesting. And then the last one is interesting, it's K brand and it's a natural cheddar, not a past or processed cheddar, which I think is very interesting. Oh, whoever is unmuted if you could mute yourself please or Catherine if you could mute them thank you um and then of course cheese was uh cheese was in particular was designed specifically as an analog to welsh rarebit welsh rarebit was like a melted cheese um dish you would put it on toast you would put it on whatever that was very popular in the late 19th and early 20th century um dates back even further but cheese was was there um attempt to make it liquid like at room temperature almost so you didn't have to go through the process of melting it in a double boiler um you would just put it on hot stuff or pop it in the oven and it was already liquidy and delicious right all right so craft dinner which in the united states is often known as craft macaroni and cheese and in canada is known as craft dinner kd um how did we get to craft dinner so in 1893, we have the World's Columbian Exposition in Chicago, which is a huge fair. Um, it's actually right on the brink of like 1893 is when we have a big depression, an economic depression in the United States. Um, but we're kind of not quite there yet when we get to this big exposition. Uh, like a lot of 19th and early 20th century fairs and expositions and world's fairs, they were all about um, technology and what was the newest and latest thing in a whole host of, of fields, including food. So James Lowcraft was a dairy farmer from living in Ontario, and he attends the World's Columbian Ex Exposition in Chicago. 
And he's very interested in dairy products and cheese. So he goes and sees like all the expositions and he realizes no matter how wholesome the cheese was when it left the manufacturer, it often reached the market in a state of extinct virtue, right? So he was talking about how easily cheese spoiled, particularly in the 1890s when you didn't have widespread use of refrigeration, you didn't have electric refrigeration yet. Um, you know, he was very concerned with the quality of cheese over time and how to keep cheese from spoiling so quickly. So in 1902, he moves to Buffalo, New York, um, specifically to start a cheese retailing business. And he actually ends up working for another cheese and dairy business that actually goes out of business while he's on a business trip to Chicago, like the year that he starts, right? So he pretty much finds himself um, on his own and he kind of copes with this job loss by um, basically becoming a cheese wholesaler. So he purchases cheese from the manufacturers and puts it on his little wagon and then goes store to store to sell it to retailers. And that's kind of how he gets involved in the cheese business. Um, he then builds up this business to bigger and bigger and really starts working on trying to figure out how can we produce cheese that isn't going to spoil quickly. And so in 1916, he's actually awarded the patent for processed cheese. So processed cheese is you take real cheese. And this is exactly how Emil Frey does it with, with uh, Velveeta too. They kind of arrive at the same process independently. Um, you take regular cheese and you melt it uh, and add other things to it. And by that melting process or the pasteurizing process, right, you, um, kind of change the chemistry of the cheese a little bit and it allows, it gives it more shelf life. Um, in 1917, the US government purchased 25 million tins of Kraft processed cheese for military use. Of course, this is for World War I, right? And for, they want cheese. Cheese is a fairly high calorie food that people really enjoy. Um, so they're using it for the military, for the soldiers. Um, they like the processed cheese because it's not gonna spoil as quickly. Right. Um, and in the 1930s, kind of like right in the height of the Great Depression, um, Grant Leslie is a craft cheese salesman and he's selling craft cheese in St. Louis. And he comes up with this idea whereby he makes little packets of shredded craft cheese and he rubber bands them to boxes of macaroni and sells them because he knows people like macaroni and cheese and he wants to sell craft cheese and get people interested in that. So this is this gimmick that he comes up with that Kraft finds out about, the Kraft company finds out about and says, this is a brilliant idea, let's kind of run with it. And in 1937, they developed Kraft Dinner. So it's um, quick cooking, macaroni, and then also a powdered cheese powdered cheese food is often how it's referred to. So that's um, what becomes Kraft Dinner. And because it's the height of the Great Depression, it becomes this instant hit as like a meal in and of itself, right? So here's a couple of options um, of their, from their advertising from 1948. This is after the Great Depression. But you can see it's Kraft in the yellow box. Now, of course, I like to talk about Kraft in the blue box, but it was originally yellow. Um, and if you can see on the box, and the second ad on the top there, it says only seven minutes cooking time required. So they're kind of capitalizing on the innovation of creamettes to be quick cooking, quick cooking pasta. And they're like, it only takes seven minutes. Um, you know, you dump the cheese packet in, you dump the milk in, stir it up, ta da, you have dinner. You don't have to make a roux, you don't have to bake it, you don't have to cook the pasta for as long, and it's cheap, cheap, cheap at a time when people really needed um, inexpensive food that would feed a lot of people, right? All right, so craft Dinner is also arriving kind of at a time of industrialization of food. Um, this is happening throughout the first half of the 20th century. People are relying a lot more on convenience foods, on brand name foods. Um, you know, people don't have as much household help 
Um, young people are living on their own much earlier. Uh, so there's this demand for easy food. Um, and then also you have a couple of things going on that make cheese very popular as a meat substitute. So vegetarianism is of interest to a lot of people starting in the progressive era. Uh, and then in both World War I and World War II, you have wartime rationing where you're rationing uh, meat. It's voluntary in World War I uh, and mandatory in World War II, but cheese becomes seen as a very um, important meat substitute. Uh, and then in the Great Depression, cheese is much cheaper than meat in a lot of ways. So it becomes one of what I call like survival ingredients. So pasta is cheap, ground beef is cheap, cheese is cheap. You can make a white sauce pretty cheaply, especially if you don't use butter. Um, or you can make it with skim milk, you know, flour is very cheap. So different ways of combining these foods uh, becomes very important for helping people to survive. All right, so how do we transition to mac and cheese, right from Kraft Dinner? So after World War II, um, mac and cheese kind of sticks around as being something very popular. And particularly in the 1950s, there's a real push toward making like housewives lives easier, right? So box dinners become very popular. I think Kraft Dinner kind of popularizes that concept. Um, it really becomes quite closely associated with children uh, and in large part because of school lunch. So the, there's a National School Lunch Act in 1946, which is in reaction to some studies about uh, nutrition among the general population, particularly children and malnutrition coming out of the Great Depression. Um, so it is easy and cheap to make a lot of macaroni and cheese. It's very popular with kids. So it comes to be closely associated with school lunch. Uh, in 1975, Kraft starts to branch out a little bit. They introduce Kraft spirals, which is a different, you know, instead of the elbow macaroni, you have spiral pasta. Um, in 1984, we get Velveeta shells and cheese, right? So remember Kraft purchased Velveeta from Emil Frey. And so that is, instead of the cheese powder, it's a packet of liquid cheese, right? Velveeta cheese that you add. Um, in the 1990s, we get kind of a pasta revival. In the early 90s, there's a lot of interest in Tuscan food and pasta. Um, you know, it doesn't have the same uh, stigma, I think, that it does now. Carbs didn't really have the same stigma in the 80s and 90s that they do now. The emphasis at that point was on fat, right? And pasta is very low fat, depending on what you put on it. But so there starts to be an interest in pasta kind of outside of Kraft dinner. Um, in 1998, uh, Kraft introduces Easy Mac, which was microwavable um, bowls of macaroni and cheese. And that is specifically catering to um, kind of like the latchkey kid population. Uh, and also, you know, kind of tweens who they want to make their own food, but it's much safer for them to use a microwave than it is for them to use a stove, right? So that's one innovation that Kraft does. Um, and then really at the turn of the 21st century, we start to get kind of a processed cheese backlash, right? Velveeta is, becomes unhealthy and Kraft singles become, you know, they're not as good as real cheese. So you start to get more of a transition of people going back to those homemade versions of macaroni and cheese or restaurant versions of macaroni and cheese. So that's what I call from craft to craft. Like you get craft cheese, uh, you get like macaroni and cheese restaurants. They're fancying up their macaroni and cheese with all different kinds of cheese. They put truffles, bacon, you know, all kinds of stuff on it. Um, there's a real restaurant boom when it comes to macaroni and cheese. It's very easy and inexpensive to make fancy, even fancy macaroni and cheese in restaurants. You start to get restaurants that specialize just in macaroni and cheese. I think there's one in Middletown. Um, and then also as we go into the um, recession, which I think has kind of continued now in the middle of our pandemic, whenever there's any kind of, um, you know, uh, economic hardship or 
um, societal hardship, we always get very nostalgic for things from our childhood or things from the past. And I think macaroni and cheese totally fits into that. Um, and then, like I said, in the middle of a pandemic, a lot of us are staying home a lot more. We're not going out to eat. Um, more of us are cooking at home. And so I think you start to see a little bit of a revival in, in macaroni and cheese and interest in macaroni and cheese because it's so delicious and comforting. All right, so I'm just going to go over briefly some of the recipes that I found throughout the ages because I think it's kind of interesting to see some of the progression. Um, so as I said earlier, we have our ancient Roman recipe of cacio e pepe, which is our finely ground pecorin pecorino romano um, mixing with hot starchy pasta water to make the sauce, right? A uh, form of curry is you layer the freshly made and cooked pasta with cheese and butter. Um, this is another early recipe uh, from the experienced English housekeeper from 1786. And this one is interesting because um, it uses Parmesan cheese as the cheese. Uh, but then she says, put in a tossing pan with about a gill of good cream, a lump of butter rolled in flour and boil it. So she's almost making like a roux, right? So you're making like a cream sauce. Um, and then you put your, your uh, boiled macaroni on a plate and put the cream sauce over top and then um, lay all over it Parmesan cheese toasted. So then I assume you put it under maybe like a salamander or something to melt the cheese on top. Um, and then send it to table on a water plate for it soon goes, goes cold. So I think that must mean like almost like, um, you know, modern catering when they have uh, those hot water baths for, for food to keep them hot, right? Very interesting recipe. Uh, and then we have our Virginia housewife recipe for both macaroni and mock macaroni and cheese. And again, you're laying it with butter and cheese. Um, this is from the Household Encyclopedia in 1859, uh, which is really, it's written as a household encyclopedia. Um, but there's a lot of scientific information. So they have a couple of different macaroni and cheese recipes. One is macaroni and cheese au gratin. Um, so that's, you know, to make something au gratin is usually to um, cook it with cheese or cream and then you put uh, breadcrumbs on top, which is pretty much what they're doing there. Um, the Neapolitan macaroni is, um, again, you're alternating uh, Parmesan and macaroni. And then interestingly, they have um, pour over some gravy, uh, letoufade, which I'm not really sure what that means. And then a half a pound of melted butter and pour it over the whole thing, right? So that sounds delicious. I would eat that. Uh, and then they have the macaroni from Milan, Milanese, um, which again, you're alternating cheese and butter, but then you're pouring milk and cream over top of it and then baking it. Um, so it's almost more like, um, you know, how we might make potatoes au gratin today. This one is from 1862 from domestic, or sorry, cookery and domestic economy. This one is fascinating because it says the macaroni and cheese pudding. And this is you're mixing eggs with white pepper, salt, made mustard or prepared mustard and ketchup, which in 1862 may or may not be tomato ketchup. It might be a, a mushroom ketchup. Um, so you're basically making an egg custard um, to pour over this macaroni and then baking it all with cheese on top. That sounded very interesting. Um, this one, so Jessup Whitehead actually published a number of cookbooks specifically written for caterers and like hotel stewards. So he has a ton of macaroni recipes in here. I'm not gonna go over all of them, although I think it's hilarious, um, his comment about English mustard and macaroni. He says, the dressing and eating of macaroni are very imperfectly understood in England. It is usually served at the end of the dinner. It should be one of the earliest dishes partaken of. Few cooks know how to buy it, boil it and either send it to the table of the consistency of pap, right? So like boiled to mush or underdone and leathery. 
Finally, at some English tables, this delicious, wholesome article of food is inflicted upon it the dire outrage of being ate with mustard. Mustard with macaroni. As well, one might eat strawberry cream with chili vinegar. So Jessica Boyd has, has very strong opinions about mustard. And he probably would be appalled that I put mustard in my, in my white sauce for macaroni. But he has a ton of different recipes, including one for lobster macaroni and cheese. Um, there's some with tomatoes, right? But a lot of it is uh, mostly, let's, it's a lot of uh, cheese and, and butter uh, and sometimes adding like a cream sauce, right? Now we have our Fanny Farmer version, which is much more like uh, how we make macaroni and cheese today. Um, this cookbook I actually have in my collection, it's breakfast, dinner, and supper, or what to eat and how to prepare it. Um, I love these, her hints, right, about macaroni and cheese, macaroni hints, in boiling macaroni, it is fatal to permit it to stop boiling for a moment until done. I have plenty of salted water in the saucepan at the boiling point when the sticks are added, right, she's talking about sticks of macaroni, and when they're tender, throw in a glass of cold water to stop the cooking suddenly and drain at once. After that, it may be served in the various ways. Great cheese on a coarse grater for macaroni and cheese instead of cutting it. Have the cheese dry, save a piece and dry on purpose for it. So that sounds like she's trying to emulate, um, you know, like Parmesan or Pecorino, the very hard dried aged cheese. And so this one, her macaroni and cheese recipe, she talks about breaking the macaroni into one inch lengths, right? And then, um, She's talking about making a white sauce. So that's much more how a lot of people make macaroni and cheese today is with the white sauce and the cheese layered um, and then baked. This was an interesting set of recipes. So the first incarnation of these recipes is from cheese and its economical uses in the diet from 1912. Um, but these same recipes show up verbatim, same order, same layout, same text in three other cookbooks, Uncle Sam's Advice to Housewives, Volume 2 from 1917, Vegetarian Diet and Dishes from 1917, and The Book of Cheese from 1918. So like total plagiarism <laughs> of these macaroni and cheese dishes. Um, but again, you know, macaroni and cheese is number one. You're making um, a white sauce with cheese, right? A Mornay sauce. I love that they have a speck of cayenne pepper in their sauce, right? Uh, number two, is again to make a rich cheese sauce and then it says and heat the macaroni in it right so you make your macaroni and then you make a cheese sauce and then you bake them with buttered crumbs on top um, and then they have some italian versions which are basically like more like spaghetti right how we would think of today but with cheese because you can't have enough cheese when it comes to macaroni um, this one from 1921 is two options for um, macaroni and cheese for catering or cafeterias, right? So if you're doing large scale cooking, again, this is 150 portions. So one calls for white sauce um, with grated cheese dissolved in the white sauce. Um, and then the other one calls, it's like a recipe for making the white sauce is just part of the recipe. So I thought that that was interesting that we're still both having um, white sauce involved in our macaroni and cheese and one is baked and or sorry, one is not baked. And then the second one is with buttered breadcrumbs, right? All right. So I want to know what everybody's favorite macaroni and cheese is. You can put it in the chat. My favorite is creamy stovetop. Um, and I prefer elbows or shells. Uh, and I like a lot of black pepper on mine, but I did actually have a birthday party one time where we had a macaroni and cheese bar. So I had like chopped scallions, tomatoes, all different kinds of cheese, including smoked Gouda, which is one of my favorites. Uh, I had bacon, all sorts of fun stuff and people got to put their own toppings on their macaroni and cheese. Okay, so that's just my contact information if anybody wants to follow up after the talk. Um, and I am going to stop sharing so I can go through. Oh, good. I see all kinds of questions. Oh, maybe not too many questions. Oh, Jackie likes hers baked with breadcrumbs. Anybody else have favorites? You can also unmute yourselves if you have any questions. I think you can unmute yourselves. 
Catherine will tell us whether or not you can unmute yourselves. You should be able to unmute yourselves. Oh, Alex likes firm and baked with a pinch of cayenne. That sounds yummy. Um, I'm actually not a super big fan of baked macaroni and cheese because I do not like dry macaroni and cheese. I'm a creamy, creamy cheese gal. There was a question, Sarah, about if you bake it, you bake it at 350, right? Yeah. Uh, but for how long? Do you have suggestions for how um, long? It's already cooked. So uh, usually just until either the cheese on top is melted um, or if you're doing breadcrumbs until the breadcrumbs are brown. So you don't need to, if you're doing the cooking the pasta and the white sauce in advance, it doesn't actually need that much more cooking. I do recommend um, that you undercook your macaroni and cheese a little bit, especially if it's a recipe where, you know, you're mixing maybe like cream and butter and cheese and the macaroni together. And so it needs more time to kind of combine. Um, so you don't want your macaroni to come out like too soggy at the end. <laughs> and it will, if it's undercooked, it will absorb more of the liquid and get more creamy. But um, if you're making a white sauce, you know, you don't want to bake it too long or it'll get too dry. So, all right, any other questions? This is a quiet group. Normally I have a whole like flurry of questions. <laughs> Did you look at their, um, I did try to put your recipe in the chat. <laughs> yes, thank you. So it is, um, it is actually a half cup of butter and a half cup of flour. Oh, okay, sorry. About a quarter milk. No, I said it wrong in the video. So oh. I just have a little text <laughs> correction. That's what happens when you're filming live. Sometimes you get stuff wrong and you have to correct yourself. Okay, Liz asks, um, can you taste the mustard when you eat it? You really can't, which is why it's so interesting to put it in the cheese sauce. Um, if you just made a white sauce with no cheese and you put mustard in, you would probably be able to taste it. But the combination of the cheddar cheese and the, the Dijon mustard, it just makes it taste a little bit sharper and it adds kind of like a little bit of a tang um, that you would get more, maybe more with like a sharp cheddar cheese. Um, I wouldn't necessarily recommend doing mustard if you're going to do a different, like if you're going to do like a Swiss cheese or something else that's not like a tangy cheese, don't put mustard in. But if you're using cheddar, mustard just gives it that little bit extra boost. Okay. Anybody else have any? I feel like, I don't know. I always get paranoid when people don't have questions. <laughs> oh, hello. Hello. Um, it, I missed the beginning. Did you do a small cooking class or demonstration at the beginning? I did. Yes. Oh, yes, okay. But it's, we're recording this. So you can go All back right. and watch it later. And it was not okay. live. It was recorded anyway. So oh, it yes, was? I, made, um, I made macaroni and cheese how I normally make it. So I made a Mornay sauce. So a white sauce with cheese. Um, and then I just boiled pasta and I so it was a stovetop mac and cheese, which is how I normally cook it. Oh. And then you started the lecture, probably. Yes. Yep. That's OK. Correct. All right. I'll try to catch the beginning of the YouTube thing. When will it be there? Like tomorrow or? Probably by the end of the day tomorrow. OK, you thank you. Fast. I really. Oh, yeah. I have another question. Are you doing any other food food discussion lecture soon or that I could sign up for? So I have um, I have a YouTube channel and I have a couple of my previous um, like combination talk and and food like cooking demos up there. And then I have a playlist of some of the other libraries have recorded some of my other talks. So they're up there. And I do have a couple um, coming up in March. Where, would, where, where could I look for this? Uh, so if March. you go to my website, thefoodhistorian.com. Yes. The upcoming talk should be right on the main page. Yeah, so okay. the next one is on uh, Thursday, March 11th with the Maya Pack Library. And it's um, a talk I do about the history of cookbooks. Oh, goody. And uh, let's see what else is coming up. I did a bunch this month. Um, yeah, I have two cookbook ones coming up in March. And then I don't think I have anything for April or May yet, but. Uh, we can talk about you coming back. Yeah. I love, I, I love, I love it. talking I, about food, so. 
I really love it. I think you, you're fun and you do a very nice job historically. It's, a, and it's just great. I love it. So thank you very much. Thanks for coming, Susan. All right, Alex actually put a couple of questions in the chat. Um, Alex says, does cheddar have to be made a certain way to be called cheddar? Um, yes, I think it does. <laughs> I don't know the exact process for making cheddar. I'd have to look that up. Um, and oh, have they ever tried to, oh, like, so when you say protect it like Stilton, you mean like give it a protected designation? Yeah, exactly. Like coming from- Question. Um, I don't think they have because I think there's so many different variations. Um, but I know that English cheddar, I think, is aged for a lot longer than American cheddar is. Um, yeah, I don't think it's it's quite as protected in like the process. It's a little bit looser than Stilton or like some of the French cheeses like Roquefort or Brie or Camembert, things like that. Um, so yeah, I think it would, I think it's too broadly interpreted. <laughs> if that makes sense to be protected. Although I'm sure, you know, cause I think Cheddar is a county or a town in England. Um, so it would not surprise me if they tried to do that but I don't think they'd have much success. Oh, Lillian. Oh, that's so cute. Okay, Lillian says uh, in eighth grade home ec, uh, her, she learned how to make macaroni and cheese exactly like I did. <laughs> so I don't actually know. I didn't, I was not like taught how to make macaroni and cheese like that. I think um, I did get some advice on white sauce from a coworker because I was telling her about, I tried to make white sauce from scratch and it failed miserably because I didn't let the the flour and butter mixture cook. So I know from experience that it tastes like wallpaper paste, but she's the one who said you have to do that. And then she also recommended equal proportions of, of butter and flour. Not everybody does it quite that same way, but that's one of the more foolproof ways I learned how to make white sauce. So, so there's a question about was the recipe corrected? So so what, what I'll do is, um, I've actually been planning to do it for a while. I will do a blog post on my website and include the correct recipe. Um, but I can also just say for the white sauce, it's um, half cup one, I'm gonna type it in the chat. Uh, half a cup of butter. Oh my gosh, can I type here? It's a half a cup of flour. <laughs> And about a quart of whole milk uh, and then one cup or more. You can put more or less cheese in there, um, hand shredded, mild or medium cheddar. Don't go too sharp. Like don't do like New York or Vermont sharp cheddar unless you're gonna add a creamier, a creamier cheese in there. Cause it does, it can, it can and will get grainy. Yep. So there's, there's the correct ratio in the chat for whoever was asking for it. Any other questions or comments? You guys are a quiet bunch. I have a question. Yeah. Well, how do you, what do you feel about um, uh, when like putting stuff into mac and cheese like lobster or other stuff like I think you can put whatever you want into macaroni and cheese I can't personally have lobster because I'm allergic to shellfish <laughs> so when we went to Maine that was a bit of a you know <laughs> my husband was like lobster grilled cheese lobster mac and cheese and I was like can I just have plain <laughs> um so that was a little bit a bit of a disappointment but uh, yeah put whatever you want in it when I was uh you know, living by myself after college, I would put like sausage and broccoli and whatever, put whatever you want in it. Mm -hmm. You people, macaroni and cheese is like an endless blank slate. I like it best plain because whenever I want macaroni, homemade macaroni and cheese, I'm like just in the mood for carbs. <laughs> you know, like you don't want to muss it up with extraneous stuff, but sure, put whatever. I'm not a purist. People can eat it however they want. <laughs> Okay, um, Jennifer is asking, um, 
she says, so just to clarify, Jennifer, if you use very, very sharp cheddar, like Vermont or New York sharp cheddar, um, the sauce will be a bit grainy because the cheese is um, super sharp and aged, so it doesn't dissolve as well into the sauce. So you'll be able to taste or feel um, in the sauce the little bits of cheese that don't melt, if that makes sense. So if you do, if you do want to use super sharp cheddar, use a creamier cheese, like a mild cheddar too, to kind of counteract that a little bit. Are people do you, if you don't if you've never made macaroni and cheese, does do people feel empowered now to go home and make their own macaroni and cheese, their own cheese sauce? I'm curious. No. <laughs> Silence, I have failed. <laughs> oh, Susan, I don't know why they switched, why Kraft switched from a yellow box to a blue box. That's a good question. I have not been able to find that out. I think it happened sometimes in the, sometime after World War II, um, but I don't know why they switch. It might just be a marketing thing. The blue box might be more easily recognizable. I really like what you were saying. You know, it was very astute that they came up with the easy Mac for the latch kid, latch key kids. Yeah, that was really so convenient. Yeah, yep. Well, and that's, you know, the, you know, I've actually done some research about microwaves and microwaves are actually adopted quite late in mm -hmm. American culture. They're, they're invented following World War II, but their first application is commercial and they're huge. Um, and it's really not until the very late 1970s that we start to get widespread manufacture of tabletop or countertop units of microwave ovens. Um, and even then they don't really get that cheap until the 80s. So it's really by the 90s, it's all of a sudden everybody has a microwave oven. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of companies are like, how can we capitalize on this? So you get the rise of microwave foods. And ironically, you know, microwave popcorn, like popcorn is actually on the patent for the original microwave oven in 1946, but it's a cob of corn in a paper bag. Yes, I've done that. And, and we don't get microwave popcorn bags like that we use today until 1986. Wow. So, and act two popcorn, this is like more random food trivia. Act two popcorn <laughs> is called act two because act one popcorn had to be refrigerated because it had real butter in it. Oh, that sounds good. I know. I'm like, bring back Act <laughs> One. <laughs> anyway, random popcorn trivia. There's another comment. Oh, yes, Joyce. I'm glad you feel empowered to make it now, Joyce. It is so much cheaper making it at home than buying it in restaurants. So much cheaper. And I have to tell you, the dried pasta, um, if you get imported Italian pasta, it does have more starch in it than most modern pasta. So if you want to make something, if you want to make a recipe where it calls for using some of the pasta water, I do recommend getting imported Italian pasta. But if you're making macaroni and cheese, I just use like the dollar grocery store brand of pasta. <laughs> as long as it's semolina pasta, like you're fine. I don't know if I'm unmuted and can you hear me? We can hear you, Lillian, yes. I can't imagine anybody eating Kraft mac and cheese after they've had the homemade one. You Even know, my I, I think it depends on how you're raised and, and taste and nostalgia, because they've actually read a couple of studies about World War II and how children who were raised in England in World War II actually preferred the taste of powdered eggs to real eggs, which my is kind of hard to believe, but. <laughs> my grandchildren, once I started making the homemade for them, my grandson's in college now, he makes his own mac and cheese. <laughs> well, once you get the hang of making the white sauce, it's actually huh. not that much more work. No, it's not. To do the homemade than it is to, you know, dump <laughs> the powdered cheese. You know, you can make, if you're, if you get talented at it, right, if you practice, you can make the sauce while the pasta is boiling and it doesn't take as much, you know, any more real time. Uh, yeah. It makes it a lot more dirty dishes. <laughs> 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 but, um, 
Yeah, it's it's a lot of personal taste. I think the craft dinner, there's a lot of nostalgia around that. And so people have nostalgia about that very specific taste of the cheese sauce. Um, but I agree with you that the homemade is better. Oh, hello. I have something to say. I, I never had macaroni and cheese ever till very, very recently. And um, then I tried the Kraft macaroni and cheese and I didn't really like it that much. But then I tried it again and I, I did like it. And um, I doctored it a little bit also. And I tried another brand. I don't remember where I got it, but it's even better. I think it's nicer and more elegant tasting. It's called Premier Pantry. Premier Pantry. Have you heard of it? I have not. I'm going to go oh. it right now. <laughs> it's, it's a nice box, a cute little brown box, I believe. It's called Premier Pantry, and it tastes very good. I think better than the craft. The craft is a little plasticky, in my opinion, but I never, I never tried to make um, homemade. This would be a big production, I think, but, uh, but I like it. I, I like better uh, pasta with tomato sauce or some other sauces, but I do like it. I'm getting to really like this uh, cheesy sauce. Yeah, it's... I think it's very American, the cheese sauce. Like even though technically Mornay sauce is French, you don't really see cheese sauce that much used in other, um, other cuisines. I think it's become kind of an American thing, probably because we love cheddar and like American style cheese so much and cheese sauce lends itself very well to that. Like if you think about like nachos and, <laughs> Like we put cheese sauce on French fries and anything that we could put cheese sauce on, it seems like we'll do it, so. Oh, so you know what I just thought of, which I might have to add to this talk going forward is I didn't talk about Stouffer's macaroni and cheese. Oh, right. So I saw Jennifer um, mentioned uh, Beecher's has a frozen brand, which made me think of Stouffer's. Um, Stouffer is actually, I do know a little bit about the history of the company, so I could talk a little bit about that. It actually started as a restaurant company, um, and they realized that they could freeze their restaurant products and get them in more households. And for a while, they actually maintained um, these kind of really high-end restaurants on top of skyscrapers. They were called like top of the whatever, and depending on what city you were in, it was like a different building, and they were these fancy restaurants most of them I think closed in the 80s um but yeah a lot of people also grew up on like Stouffer's frozen macaroni and cheese which is like very rich and creamy baked macaroni and cheese um but I agree that homemade is always better <laughs> and usually the more cheese you put in it the better like a cup is like you can get away with just a cup but there are people who put pounds of cheese in their macaroni and cheese so Alrighty. Well, if if nobody has any other questions or comments, I think we can be done. But you guys can track me down. I'm on Facebook. Um, I'm on. I'll drop my com stuff in the comments here. There's my Facebook. On Instagram, I'm at Preserve or Parish. Um, and then if you just Google, if you just Google, if you just search for me on YouTube. Um, it'll show up and you'll, you'll be able to see some of my other talks there as well. So, and if anyone wants to email me, there's my email right in the chat if you want to follow up. And I will try and get, um, before the end of the week, I will try and get that blog post up uh, with the more complete recipe for how to make macaroni and cheese that we talked about tonight. Sarah, thank you so much. Thanks for having me, Catherine. Super fun as always. And thanks everybody for attending and eventually asking questions. Yeah. <laughs> we can talk about something for the, for the spring. There we go. I'm around. All right. You know how to get me. Okay. All right. Okay, Good night, bye, guys. Thank you for joining us. Good night, everyone. Thanks again, Sarah. Thank you. I have, Sarah, are you still there? No, I think oh, she's off. Okay, I have a suggestion. Maybe she can 